Welcome back to What the Forensics. This is Journey, Nicole, and Rebecca. We are so glad to have you back. And for those who are new, welcome. Um, we're still recording remotely because of COVID-19 and are working to get our audio perfected. Um, also for this episode, we will be covering topics of sexual assault, assault and murder. So listeners discretion is advised. Um, and Nicole, if you wanted to start us off with a little bit of a case study that I know you've been researching. Yeah, so um, today's episode's focus, we mentioned, is about, like, through all of our social media and whatnot, we were promoting, and it's about the Golden State Killer, because it's a recent trial that has just been happened. And um, so just to start off, like, his early life, there isn't a whole lot about the Golden State Killer. We recently found out that it's Joseph D'Angelo. So he was born in Bath, New York, 1945, and he spent most of his childhood, sorry, in the suburbs of Sacramento, an area where he would later commit many of his rapes. Um, he then moved to Auburn, California, after his mother married a traveling welder, and his mother worked as a waitress for her career. Later on, in 1965-ish, he served in North Vietnam in the United United States Navy for about 22 months, and he actually earned three different medals upon returning home. So he was quite a decorated veteran. Um, while he was away as well, for some reason, this is like one of the things his neighbors described about him. He was seen as pleasant and clean cut, but apparently he lost a finger while he was away in the Navy. So that was just something that his his neighbor was just like, yeah, he's so he's not completely clean cut because he's missing a finger. <laughs> he's really nice we, in every other way. But he's missing a finger. <laughs> but he's missing a finger. What an odd comment. Well, okay. Yeah. And ironically, uh, he actually studied criminal justice at California State University, Sacramento, which is kind of funny in the fact that he became a serial rapist and a serial killer. Mm -hmm. um, and he graduated with a bachelor's degree in 1972. Another weird fact about this, too, is that it was said that he was engaged to this woman named Bonnie, but nothing ever came of their marriage. But one of his rape victims that survived said that the, her rapist would cry over the name Bonnie while he was raping her. So that was like one thing that she mentioned to the police. And like, yeah, he was just saying Bonnie over and over again while he was crying and raping me, which is quite traumatic, like, if you consider it. That wow, is so that's... weird. And then eventually he ended up marrying a different woman. Her name's um, Sharon Marie Huddle in 1973, and they ended up having three kids during their marriage, um, which is kind of surprising. He went 40 years going undetected after all of this, had three kids. He had a super normal life. And then all of a sudden, Joseph D'Angelo's 74 now. And he was just like captured, not captured, but he was arrested in his home randomly one day. And his family was like, what the heck is going on? That's it's so, so scary weird. that he got away with it for so long that he was like, I'm going to have a normal life now with some mm -hmm. kids and I'm going to have a loving family. And they Do were living with a monster this whole time. Yeah. Do you think that his wife had any idea that he was a serial killer or serial rapist? I don't rapist? think so. I don't know what caused him to stop, though. Like, he went yeah. 40 years without committing a crime. Like, typically, they'll stop for a certain amount of period, like, a certain amount of time. But then they'll continue, there'll be something that happens in their life and they continue after that. But it's strange that he just went for this long period of time and he was just like, yeah, I don't want to do it anymore. Do you think that he did other crimes or, like, did some that we just don't know about? Honestly, probably, because he was known as, like, the East Area Rapist, the original Night Stalker, and the Golden State Killer. So he's got he three different... He was the original Night Stalker? Yeah. So it wasn't... I did not um, know that. Ramirez is the Night Stalker, right? The or current yeah. Night Stalker. The current <laughs> Night Stalker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So he was the original, I guess, because he started off as like a peeping Tom and then it turned into rape. So then he was the East Area Rapist. And then obviously that escalated to murder. And now he was the Golden State Killer. So if he's got three titles under his belt, I have a strong feeling that he dabbled in some other stuff during those 40 years. 
That is My so goodness. weird. Mm-hmm. So um, going into his crimes, if the people listening don't really know about him, um, he was a police officer in Exeter, California from 1973 to 1976. So he was he actually... Was yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, that is officer. awful. That's so scary. And so it was believed that he actually commit his first rape while he was on this police force. <laughs> and so in 1975, he shot and killed the professor in front of the professor's daughter while he was trying to abduct her. So the he professor has no was, shame. No shame. Um, so he was still on the police force at this time since it was before 76 when he stopped working there. Um, he went in trying to kidnap the daughter who was 16 year old 16 years old at the time the father heard so the father tried to go save her so he ran out d'angelo shot him a couple times in front of the daughter and then he just biked off apparently that was his like method of escape was just bicycle and then he ditched the bike and (laughs) continued times were so much easier for criminals without (laughs) dna i know (laughs) So after being a police officer in Exeter, he moved to Auburn and was a police officer on the Auburn Auburn force. So for three years, 76 to 79. But apparently he stole a hammer and dog repellent from a drugstore. Like it's an odd combo. Um, I don't want to know what he was doing with those two. (laughs) But he ended up getting fired from the police force because of this, because obviously you don't, well, I mean, if they found out he was raping people, he'd obviously not be on the police force either. Any sort of crime, you'd be fired for that. But um, makes sense. Yeah. So from 76 to 78, he was labeled the East Area Rapist. And that title was given to him in October of 76. And that was after six rapes had already happened in the time span of three months. Wow. So they figured, hey, this maybe must be the same person. Happening in the same area, there's been six plus one attempted kidnap or kidnapping. So it's got to be the same person. At first, he would just enter homes as his victims slept. He'd burglarize and rape the victims. But he wouldn't really, like, burglarize the house. He just kind of made a mess and destroyed things. Like, I don't think his intentions were to steal valuables. If anything, it was just like sentimental pieces. So it was like jewelry, IDs, occasionally cash. But like it wasn't a, oh, let me steal everything of value from your house. I'm just going to rape you and destroy your house in the meantime. When they arrested him, do you know if they found any previous belongings of his victims? Yeah, I'm pretty sure they found a couple IDs and... um jewelry pieces that could be matched to the victims like family members came forward and were like yeah this was whoever in my family the only reason I can see for him burglarizing and only stealing those is mementos of his victims which I think is gross (laughs) yeah which is so creepy keeping it as what are they like treasures what's the yeah treasures or mementos like things to remind him of his victims which is creepy because a lot of the times these like serial rapists use these mementos when they're at home to remind themselves of the rape they commit and it gets them off on it which is disgusting yeah it must have worked for him though because he didn't commit any more crimes for 40 years so they must have been (laughs) massive (laughs) mementos just a a whole store okay this is kind of rude but a whole storage locker just filled of ids just that was his weekly outing was to a storage locker to could you enjoy imagine? himself? Yeah, that'd Ew. be awful. I really hope that wasn't the case. It definitely wasn't because it wasn't wasn't in any of the news articles. But it still. was never reported on. <laughs> but it would have been gross. But it would have been gross. Yeah. Um, so he actually raped over fifty victims oh in my this goodness. Sacramento County, and then it ended up being his first victims of murder were Brian and Kate, Katie. Majwar, I'm not sure. I'm definitely butchering their last name. But they were just out walking their dog one day. And I guess he just came by, shot the husband, and then Katie um, ran away. 
Like mm-hmm. she got away somehow, but then D'Angelo ended up running after her and got to her as well and shot her, unfortunately. So did he just shoot them and leave them? Oh yeah. He just oh probably on his bike he rode away. It so, was it didn't so stand for an there. evening bike ride. Yeah. Just like these two people look like they could be shot. Let's shoot them. That's very scary. <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah, yes it is and the interesting thing too was he had um a specific kind of mo that he seemed to create as he became more of this east area rapist um and so an mo for anyone that doesn't know what that means is modus operandi and that's a pattern or method an offender often follows so d'angelo seemed to be that he would bind couples, so a male and a female at that time, he chose male and female couples, with shoelaces or pieces of fabric, so both their hands and feet. And then what he would do is he'd place stacks of dishware on the male's back. And then if he said, if he were to hear these dishes fall, everyone in that household would be dead. So it was his way of ensuring that the male wouldn't try and escape to get help or try and help the female, as D'Angelo was raping the woman. Wow. Holy shit. Sorry for... (laughs) Oh, my God. Yeah, so that... They found a lot of these plates at these crime scenes because that was his way of telling them to be quiet, and then he'd go and rape the woman. Unfortunately, it's kind of smart, and I hate that I'm saying that it's smart, but... It makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. It it's it's a very unfortunate smart move. <laughs> <laughs> I feel little, like just... that's the nicest way we can say that. <laughs> yeah. Because like, it's not it's... like people have bells at their disposal. It's not like he's gonna show up to a crime scene with like jingle bells and tie it onto their clothes. Well I mean it'd be pretty tough to run away with a jingle bell and be like, oh no, just fall the sleigh bells. It's not Santa. <laughs> He just <laughs> raped my entire family, so if you could catch him quickly, that'd be fantastic. Is it Christmas in August? No way. <laughs> nope, just a serial rapist. Uh, okay. Well. <laughs> so uh, between the years of 1978 to 1981, he had actually killed 11 people at that time. Wow. And they were all couples except one person. And the one was... Well, at the end, so from 81 to 86, there was just nothing. Like, there were no rapes reported, or at least no no rapes of that same MO or same characteristics. But then in 86, 18-year-old Janelle Cruz was found dead, and this was his last known crime. So 86 was kind of the end of his era, his time period, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's been linked to 12 murders and 45 rapes through DNA. So it's definitely him that's done 12 murders, 45 rapes. But he's also wow. suspected to have raped over 50 people and burglarized over 120 houses. That oh is my. unreal. How do, you have, how do you have time to do 120 houses and get away with it for four years? Yeah, like, it, I can understand if someone were to get away with, like, three burglaries. It's like, you know what? You had a good run. Get out of there before you get caught. <laughs> but right? 120. Like, he's just cocky at that point. And if he's, not, if he's not stealing anything of valuable, it's not like he's running out with TVs at that time or, I don't know, anything of valuable in the 80s, beyond I mean, my years, but. Well, yeah, and I mean, like, I guess it was the old, well, olden days for us, um, so they probably didn't have, like, video cameras. Oh, my mom's gonna watch this and be so mad, guys. Video cameras were a thing. She had they a video def- camera in the they 90s. Definitely existed. So they, had <laughs> well, they definitely yeah. existed. Well, yeah. They definitely existed. We're not this young, guys. Amazing. Whoever's listening, whoever's listening, we're not this young, okay? We're in our 20s. It's just, it's 2020. We're 2000s and 99 babies, so. (laughs) 
80s is before our time. We'll have to consult with the parentals on this one. Yes. Um, yeah, so all in all, Sacramento County, he had two counts of murder, nine counts of kidnapping to commit robbery using a weapon. Santa Barbara County, four counts of murder, rape and murder of Deborah Manning. In Tulare County, I believe it's pronounced, one count of murder, and that was the professor where he ran after his daughter, and one count of attempted kidnapping. And then Ventura County, he had two counts of murder and one rape of the Smith couple. And so just if any of our listeners want to see an extensive timeline of his crimes, we have an article in our source list that's called um, in quotations, these are the crimes D'Angelo pleaded guilty to in Golden State Killer case. They have like an extensive what month, what day, what year each crime was committed, which is kind of really neat that they were able to break that all down. Yeah, that's crazy because so, he did commit a lot. Like that must be a busy timeline in such a short amount of time. Yeah. And then 40 years, he just went undetected from... The police, because they, whenever they had a lead, it just led nowhere. Yeah. But now, because there was an inv- advancement, like Rebecca, you know a bit more about this, but how was it that he ended up being caught? It's super neat, actually. There's a lot of ethical problems surrounding it right now uh, because it's pretty new. Um, but he was actually caught through using methods of forensic genealogy. Um, so for those who aren't familiar with genealogy, it's the study of family history and origins. And with recent advancements of technology, we've been able to take it a step further to genetic genealogy. So with genetic genealogy, we're able to combine genetic analysis and genealogy to compare DNA samples to find familiar connections. Are these like genetic genealogy? That's kind of like um, 23andMe, Ancestry. Yeah. Those sort like those type of companies where you can do a swab, send it in and they tell you tell you kind of your ancestry. Yeah, exactly. So that's what uh, places like Ancestry do. They have a big database of DNA that people have sent to them. And these are just databases that are really to connect you to your family and help you make your own lineage. Um, So with genetic genealogy, we have made our first forensic genealogy lab, which was founded in 2017 by Dr. Margaret Press and Dr. Colleen Fitzpatrick. Uh, They founded the DNA Doe Project, which their initial usage of it was uh, to use common genetic genealogy methods, such as looking at autosomal DNA to find family members of unknown uh, bodies in hoping of identifying the bodies of these unknown victims. Um, So considering 2017 was the first time forensic genealogy really made itself known. That's three years. That's three years ago. That's That's crazy. crazy. So, wow. Um, My dogs are older than that. My dogs (laughs) are older than genealogy. Well, not genealogy in itself. But the use in criminal investigations. Yeah, insane. So uh, the first time anyone really found anything with genetic genealogy or forensic genealogy was the 10th of April, 2018, which was when the DNA Doe Project identified their first victim, which was commonly just referred to as the buckskin girl. Uh, She was identified as Marcia L. King from Arkansas. She was from a strangulation case in Ohio in 1981. Why and what I it, think, wait, sorry, so why was it buckskin? Was it like related to how she died or where she died? Do you know anything of that by sort like chance? Because I feel like buckskin's just, was it a hunting accident? Was she found near hunting cabins? I don't know if anything of that. I, if I could be completely honest, I'm not sure why she was called the buckskin girl. Oh, um, oh that's a lie. I looked it up. So she had been wearing a fringed buckskin jacket with a Native American design. So that's what Wikipedia is telling me on a first search. So so they, they identified her. They called her by her jacket, basically. Basically, yes. Nice. I mean, I guess if this is her only distinguishing feature. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of like um, a bog body. True. Yeah. If you guys were to be found murdered, what would your your name be? <laughs> I have to think about that one. I feel like I'd be the generic blonde girl found dead. <laughs> <That would be mine. laughs> 
I'd probably be like another one of Ted Bundy's victims. <laughs> <laughs> Just brown hair, glasses, pretty. Yep. University student. Pretty much yeah. sums it up. <laughs> um, so the buckskin girl, 10 days, not 10 days. 14 days after they found uh, the identity of the buckskin girl, they arrested the Golden State Killer based on information from Forensic Genealogy on uh, GEDmatch.com. So 14 days after our first discovery using the science. (laughs) So were they just kind of waiting until a case was solved using this? So they couldn't really be um, like... The defense couldn't really go against them in court saying, well, this isn't even a science. Because I know with forensic linguistics with Ted Kaczynski, like Ted Kaczynski's case was the first with forensic linguistics. And that was his like one of his um, arguments was that, well, this isn't even really a science. Mm -hmm. So uh, in terms of ethics and whether or not they can use this in court. It hasn't been discussed a lot because it's it's kind of like a loophole in the justice system in that it never uh, the GEDmatch.com website never specified that police couldn't use it. So they actually had said that the police had uploaded over a hundred cold case DNA samples to GEDmatch.com before the owners and runners of the website realized the police were using it for their DNA database. Well, didn't they also submit a profile using a fake name with um, DNA they got off of, like, D'Angelo's tissue that he had thrown in the garbage? So that was, like, a huge controversial, controversial thing, too, because the way that they obtained his DNA was once they kind of had an idea of who he was as a suspect, they just trailed him until he dropped something that could be used for DNA. So Mm -hmm. it wasn't like they went to him with a warrant or anything of that sort. He just was like, well, it's, it's been forfeited. It's public property now. So it's ours. And then Mm -hmm. they used that in his case, which is kind of like, it, like, yes, legally you forfeited your DNA, But if that's the case, just are you going to hoard all of your stuff? Like if you're a criminal, are you just going to sit in your filth? and Are you just never going to throw out your garbage? Never. Like that's crazy to me. Because then, yeah, they took his DNA um, from that tissue paper. They had a couple samples, I think, from they literally went trash diving to get DNA samples from D'Angelo, created a fake profile and then found relatives through that fake profile. That's so I can, yeah. yeah, I can see how some of the ethical, um, how there could be an ethical dilemma with that. Yeah, so after um, D'Angelo was arrested, which the only way the runners of the website found out that the police had been using it was because they were watching the news and heard how the Golden State Killer got caught. <laughs> So it's not that the police had informed them that they their website had helped with the case. They had to watch the news to find out that their database was help was helpful in infiltrating a criminal. <laughs> Imagine, so, oh my gosh, go ahead, Jenny. And so I know we kind of like t- touched on this a little bit, but like, what do you guys think of obtaining evidence that way and putting it or like linking it to family members? so that you can solve a crime like as a family member how would you feel about that it's really tough because on one hand like do you want to infringe on the rights of the public to catch dangerous people or do you want the government and police to have access to all of your dna all the time i mean i feel like if anyone in my family was a serial killer i'd be screw them they're going to jail take my dna if you need it but like yeah if my dna is already in a database and they somehow obtain dna from a criminal and it's matched to my dna not my dna but obviously genetics their similarities i'd say screw them take my dna look for Mm -hmm. the similarities (laughs) 
don't want to live or be related to a serial killer. Sorry, mom or dad. Obviously, honestly, it'd probably be my brother of all people. But you know what? <laughs> He's going to jail if that's the case. <laughs> he is not a serial killer. Don't worry. But <laughs> thanks for watching. But if any of us is going to be a serial killer, it'd be you. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. I don't think be so there. the ethical concern regarding how the police use this is also a concern because people are uh, a lot of people are okay with it because in the new privacy policy of GED match, they've specified that DNA obtained and authorized by law enforcement could be uploaded uh, to identify a perpetrator of a violent crime. But what constitutes a violent crime yeah. to the police? It started as homicides only, but they've started mm-hmm. adding DNA from sexual assaults. And they actually also caught uh, someone who was arrested because he assaulted a elderly woman and she he was caught for, through genealogy really so people are concerned that they might start trying to use this for not petty crimes but smaller crimes such as robbery or drug crimes and stuff like that i feel like we don't have the resources to do it for smaller crimes though like i understand no. bigger crimes like in violent crimes like rob not robbery sorry but assaults and sexual assault murders but if there's just a, like, break and enter, I don't think they're going to go through the hassle of running a genealogy search, trying to put together, um, what are the family trees to try and find yeah. a suspect. I like, think I think they just don't have the time to do that. That and there, there's not always DNA in every yeah. case. Yeah, yeah that's no, true. We exactly. talked about that last week. Yeah. Yeah, and, like, another problem that people are having is that they're complaining that the FBI already has their own database. They have CODIS, which, for Mm -hmm. people who don't know, is the Combined DNA Index System. Um, So they have CODIS, but the problem with that is that despite the fact that it has millions more samples than GED match, it only has samples from, like, criminals, missing persons, or unidentified persons, and military personnel. So yeah. unless you are a criminal, an unidentified body, or a military member, we're not looking for your DNA. So yeah, that's the reason with, they wanted. Yeah. yeah, with GED match, they were looking to that because they can compare to like anybody who's put their DNA up there. Which at the time they had, I think, 1.3 million users at the time they were doing this. Yeah, I don't think we covered it, but isn't GED match? a database where they take they not take but they're given all of the dna information from other sources so like 23andme they have all the dna submitted into ged match um yeah so ancestry is put in there as well it's just yeah so you can get your dna taken from ancestry or 23andme Uh, And then you, as your own person, can choose to upload your DNA to GED Match to try to find more family. Oh, so they're, like, voluntarily uploading their DNA to this database. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and now with, like, because they found out that the police have been using it, uh, the change on the website has been that they now allow you to opt in to police accessing your DNA on it, but... I personally think it would make more sense to have people opt out. Yeah. Yeah. But I it feel like either be... way, it's there for them to use. Like, True. they're the exactly. police. But I believe... Nothing was stopping them before. Yeah. And, like, to date, people who have opted in since the police have had access and have changed policies, only about 100,000 out of their over 1 million users have opted in to give their their dna access i mean like i guess if you come from a family where crime is like oh what's the word i'm thinking of um prevalent yeah where crime is prevalent you're probably not going to opt into your dna being accessible to the police so i think it kind of weeds out maybe the more the crime families yeah i don't want to call crime families but (laughs) in that case wouldn't their dna already be in the police dot like in CODIS since they're criminals and I assume they've been charged with something or other. But maybe it's like 
okay, I know my brother's a murderer or whatever, but his DNA isn't in the system and my DNA isn't in the system. But because I know that he's maybe not the greatest, but I'm just turning a blind eye, I don't want to have my DNA accessible to the police when I'm looking for my parents. Yeah. That and the, the tough sense. thing with that too, though, is these can go to like third cousins, can't they? Like they can trace it back to a third cousin. Yeah. So, so it's actually, tough because you don't even really know who you're protecting, if that's even the proper word for it. Like, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And you can see like distant relatives and stuff too with websites like GED Match because they're looking for uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms in our DNA. So all that is, is a mutation that happened in our DNA like a long time ago that makes us unique from somebody else. So they're what make our like great great grandmother our great great grandmother and not yours like I have a different mutation than you might have on certain genes um so those are helpful because those are used to look at like farther out family like third cousins great grandparents all the family you have it can essentially see that but CODIS uses short tandem repeats which are, they mutate much more frequently, and usually they're just a small sequence in your DNA that either gets repeated or uh, the repeat cuts. There's just more people as an option, essentially, if you're using any yeah, S&Ps. More, yeah, basically there's more people you can search from a family point of view using single nucleotide polymorphisms over short tandem repeats. Which is helpful, too, in a family tree case, because I know with D'Angelo, like the Golden State Killer, they the individual that they got a hold of and asked to use her DNA was, I think, his third cousin. It was a distant cousin, and she was like, oh, yeah, okay, I guess I'll give it to you, and it ended up being a match. And they, um, like, if they hadn't used this site, they wouldn't have been able to reach that far and have found yeah if that makes sense well it's been a cold case for over like 40 years and suddenly in 2017 there's a new forensic science and we can catch this very dangerous person i'd really like to know the person who thought like hey we have his dna let's put it into this website because that would have been like an amazing breakthrough like to be that person and to have it work it would be so cool I feel like also now that we've learned about it and we're talking about it, I feel like that's just like, why wouldn't you do that? Like, yeah, I have DNA, put it in a DNA database. Like, yeah, there's nothing against it. Every single one. Yeah. But the cops were probably like, whoa, no way. (laughs) (laughs) Why didn't I think of that? Yeah, right. But I think it took them like four months of just creating different family trees. And then with each time, they narrowed it down by the suspect pool, and they ended up with, like, three different family trees associated with his DNA in GED match. And that's how they found the cousin. And then they linked it from that. Oh, okay. Isn't that crazy? So crazy. It's... I find genealogy so cool. I could spend hours (laughs) making my family tree, but it can get confusing. (laughs) But, like, I've also heard, so this episode we've been talking about genealogy, but I know in forensics we had a lesson also on familial searching or, like, familial, um, what is it, genetics, I guess. Like, what are the differences between those two? Because I would have considered they were the same, especially since they're both associated with a family tree, aren't they? (laughs) I have the um, familial searches are where criminals are linked to a crime by kinship. So it's kind of like what I was talking about, or like what I had asked about before. Um, If they, if you have like a brother whose DNA is in the database and they think that it was a relative of this person, then they would enter and see if there was a partial match or whatever on CODIS. But then forensic genealogical searches are where they use like 23andMe, Ancestry or GED match instead of like CODIS. Oh, so familial searching is just, like, looking for someone in your family, whereas, like, genealogy searches is branching out and 
my brain is too small to understand this. (laughs) I'm like, they're literally the same. Like you have people, DNA, family tree. I'll be honest. I get them mixed up as well. I don't quite understand the difference of them because I think they're so similar that they're almost interchangeable. Almost, except I think like familial is like you're looking for someone who's directly like it's um, yeah yeah it's directly related and it's through a police database whereas a genealogical search is like you're looking for the third cousin or the great grandmother or something from like a public website I would imagine oh Oh, god that makes sense (laughs) <laughs> yeah it's more of like they're just kind of looking for a partial match on CODIS to kind of like figure out which family this was and then kind of investigate further in there and then with the forensic genealogical one you're just kind of winging it hoping for anything <laughs> do you guys uh think that you have a third cousin that may be a serial killer that you could find through GED match maybe I'll you. go check it out I have my DNA. I'll go check it out. Oh, yeah. Didn't you do 23andMe? Yeah, I've done an Ancestry one. Well, how do... So what do the results come back like? What do they tell you? Because I know they all differ. Um, Mine on Ancestry, so they give me a list of people that I'm related to based on my DNA and how many... How long the strips of DNA are that are similar to each other. So it breaks it down to like, these people are your first cousins. These are your second to fourth cousins. These are your fifth to eight. But as the amount of DNA that's the same gets smaller and smaller, the harder it is to kind of narrow it down. So like there's like first cousins and then there's fifth to eight cousins oh. where it's like, we don't know how closely are related, but it's somewhere in that bubble. <laughs> that's interesting. Because I know 23 and me, I think it is. They tell you what part of the world your family's from isn't it yeah mine mine did that as well so it oh, gave okay. me a it gave me a map of the world and then it highlights areas that people that shared my dna might have immigrated from to get to canada uh or where a lot of them settled and it shows where the settlements happened um and where we originated from it's very neat that's super cool so do you think I the love- police officers had done that with D'Angelo then? Like kind of trace back that far? Or do you think they just did a ancestry type thing, first to eighth cousin, not caring where they were from? I feel like they probably do that because I guess it doesn't really matter where in the world you are. Like if we're related, we can be related and still be on other sides of the world. That's true. That's true. Um, But do you think they would have done that just because they could have figured out, like, more of where he grew up? Or is this just looking at your ancestors? This doesn't tell you where they're actually from. I could be thinking of, like, carbon dating or where they, like, isotopic analysis, I think is what I'm thinking of. I don't know if it would tell where exactly like it could be like north america but i don't think it would say sacramento california kind of thing (laughs) like it wouldn't be (laughs) and if the police were like yeah well this guy's in north america well where in north america you know like yeah yeah it wouldn't yeah it's like narrow it down a little um Yeah, but that's forensic genealogy and how it worked to arrest the Golden State Killer. Um, and I know that his um, his trial was actually quite recent. And I think, Nicole, you have a bit to say about that. Yeah, so that's kind of why we're, we thought it would be a good topic to talk about um, this week, especially. Because today we're filming it on September 8th of 2020. It was actually June 29th of 2020 where um, he pled guilty to 13 homicides, 13 counts of kidnapping with intent to rob, and admitted to committing dozens of rape and other offenses. Wow. Yeah. So (laughs) that's not even encompassing, like, the whole extent of things. Because it says admitted to committing dozens of rape and other offenses. Well, like... How many? What other offenses? Because I know it said that he's suspected of over 120 um, break-in entries. 
Yeah. So, and it's tough too, because, um, I think they said he can't be charged with anything before, what was it? Seven, 1970. Yeah. I think, I think it that's was. What you said. Yeah. I, I forget why, but I think it was like, you have a certain amount of period and anything past that you just legally can't. Yeah. I think it's a statute of limitations that you're thinking about. There's just, it's almost like they've put a time limit on crime. Yeah, so if you, can silly, evade, if you can evade the law for this many years, you're off the hook. <laughs> Which yeah. shouldn't be a thing. <laughs> no, uh, not, not at all. With forensic anthropology, when they're looking for um, burials, um, they have to decide if the burial is current or historic. And it's current if it was within the last 50 years. Really? And it's historic if it was if it's any older than that. So since it's 2020, it was 1970s. It must just be again like historic. you have a <laughs> limit time limit on crime. It's a, technically a historic crime, so they can't charge you for it because it was more than 50 years ago. That's crazy. That is crazy. If yeah. he had ev- well, I don't know if he'll live for another 10 years, but if he had evaded cops for another 10 years, like would he have might have been had a- charged? He might have just had a perfectly normal life besides what he did in the 70s and 80s. How does he live with that? Like, I don't understand how he went 40 years with a loving wife. I'm not saying he was a terrible father, a terrible husband. I don't know. I didn't find any information about it. But, like, just mentally, how do you live with that? He must just be able to turn his emotions off. And be like, I wish yeah, I, I did that. Honestly, <laughs> <laughs> not because I could go around killing people. It would just be nice little switch on off, done with the day. Okay, <laughs> I'm done with Pretty emotions much. today. Yeah. Yep. yep, too much effort for me. <laughs> well, anyways, <laughs> like not even a month ago, on August 21st of 2020, he was given, he was sentenced, um, the max sentence possible by law. So he was given 11 consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole with an additional life sentence and extra years on top of that. Holy smokes. This man's 74. (laughs) So he got like a couple hundred years, like at at least a couple hundred years of life sentences. And he might serve like at most 15, maybe. I I don't think he'll make it that far. He's not a very healthy looking feller. No. I gotta say. And I don't know how it differs in the States, but I know like in Canada, if he were to be tried in Canada, he could have had the possibility of parole after 25 years, but because he just doesn't, he's not allowed that. So I don't know if like 25 years is kind of considered a life sentence if you have the possibility of parole. 25 years is generally considered a life sentence in Canada. I was pretty sure. So I that's thought, 275 probably. years. Holy. With an additional life sentence. So that's 300 years. Um, with a couple extra on top. Just to add a just little cherry the on the chop. <laughs> so we'll go with maybe 315 years. Wow. Do you think if there's an afterlife, he will be serving 315 years of his afterlife in prison? I would hope so. I yeah. hope. He kind of deserves that. Yeah. I would hope so. I don't Wouldn't that be interesting, though? If well, just like, criminals if never ended deal. up. <laughs> <laughs> if they never finished their life sentence, so they had to finish it in an afterlife. That would be so weird. I guess there's one way to find out when we go. Ouija board me if I become a criminal <laughs> and I don't finish my sentence. Pull that Ouija board out, please. Give I me a it. ring. Give me a seance. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. All right. So um, that pretty much concludes this episode. And to decide what we're going to talk about for our next episode, Nicole is going to do a number generator because she has a big book of serial killers that has the numbers 1 to 150 
serial killers in it, which is absolutely bonkers. Um, so she's going to do a number generator and then let us know who we're talking about next week. Yeah, so I don't want to be that super weird person that just has a big book of serial killers, but that definitely is who I am. And I do have the big book of serial killers um, by Jack Rosewood. You can find it on Amazon. <laughs> so my random number I got is nine, which gives us uh, Paul Bernardo, which is actually a very interesting case because I grew up um, a couple towns over from where he commit his crimes and one of his victims is actually from my hometown so this will be interesting it gives our listeners something to kind of listen forward to so next week will be paul bernardo he also worked with Car- his wife um carla Homoka. so i'm sure we'll talk about her as well it'll be nice too to have a canadian case oh uh, yeah i mean the case itself isn't very nice <laughs> But no, <laughs> the case itself is, is quite We're Canadian. We, lo- we just love but Canada. <laughs> we like to talk about Canada in every way, even if it's crime. Do you know what's <laughs> kind of funny? So, me, of course, I have a serial killer coloring book because who wouldn't? And we are the people we are. I know you have one too, Journey. And I think, Rebecca, you as well. You also have one. I sure do. I sure do. <laughs> um, <laughs> Paul Bernardo and Carla Homoka in my, my book they had like they're the only Canadian case in it, and of course they put a maple leaf and a bottle of maple syrup on it. I <laughs> love that. It's got to be stereotypical, are, even for the criminals. Even for the criminals, like ser- maple syrup, nothing to do with their case, not at all. <laughs> but inclined to include it. That's <laughs> fantastic. All anyway, right. so um, in conclusion. Where can our listeners find us, Rebecca? Our listeners can find us on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook at What the Forensics or Twitter at WT Forensics PC. You can also find us on our website, which has been launched earlier this week, which is whattheforensics.ca, where you can find a little bit of more information about us, uh, as well as more information about the podcast. You can listen to it there and also see all the sources that we use on every episode. If you want to fact check us, because we don't have <laughs> fact checkers for the fact checkers. So, <laughs> exactly. Sources are there. Okay, before we sign off, I have a joke for you guys. Oh, no. You didn't I tell am us. I'm so excited. <laughs> okay, okay, what is it? Why did the forensic pathologist call in sick to work? Why? She had the coroner virus. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> journey (laughs) i thought that's incredibly relevant (laughs) it is it is where do you find these actually i don't want to know i don't want to know um just keep keep your jokey magic i love it i love these cheesy jokes my head hurts because of that and i'm cringing a little on the inside but it's also (laughs) one of the best jokes i've heard this past week actually month well please share it (laughs) I don't think people will appreciate it as much as us. So that's true. That's true. <laughs> that's okay. All I appreciate right. it. It was very funny. I hope our listeners laughed as hard as we did. If not, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, our sense of humor is a little different. <laughs> God, and it's a good dad joke. Um, All and right. Then- <laughs> <laughs> so- <laughs> Jenny, Rebecca, and Nicole. And this has been another awkward and excellent episode of what the forensics thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next time just to let you guys know we are not professionals in the forensic science field we are all still students we just want to give you guys the most accurate information from our point of view from our side of things the students in forensic sciences do not cite us on anything quote us on anything critique us on claiming we are professionals because we are not but we just want to have fun and hope you guys are having fun during this as well so thank you and we hope to see you guys next week